Hello everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Daily Gray Refuel, where we recap the latest news in the Ethereum ecosystem. I'm your host, Anthony Sassano, and today is the 24th of May, 2021. All right, everyone. Uh, you all had a good weekend, right? We all uh, we all got got rich, right? No, no, no. Jokes aside, here it was a pretty brutal weekend in the markets. Of course, I mean, I have the chart up here. You know, we've come back up a little bit from the lows here, but it's been a pretty. I mean, not just the last weekend, but I guess the last two weeks have been, you know, quite quite bad in the markets, right? We topped out at forty four hundred on ETH, and we went all the way down to what is it, seventeen twenty three or something. That's the the local low here now. You know, there's tons of kind of speculation on on Twitter about like why did this happen? You know, why did we fall so hard? Uh, you know, is it this like the end of the bull market and all this sort of stuff? And I went over a lot of that last week or or, or kind of on last week's refuels. I think what I did want to focus on today is is two main things really. It's the news that came out over the weekend around China and Bitcoin and Bitcoin mining and things like that. And also this meme from from Mooney here. So before I get into the meme, I do want to talk about what happened with uh, with China and and the price action there. So there's conflicting reports. I haven't seen anything definitive yet, and I've seen a bunch of threads, a bunch of news articles, you know, tons of stuff going on about this. But from what from my reading, essentially what happened was China, or at least some high ranking officials in the Chinese government, announced that they were going to ban coal mining for BTC, so renewable only um, Bitcoin mining, and also cracking down on centralized exchanges and trading of crypto, um, and you know basically uh, regulating that much more heavily. Now, you know we've all heard the FUD um, in the past, like China bans Bitcoin, all this sort of stuff, right? I think this time it's a little bit more than far. There's a little bit more um, substance to it, and of course, a lot of people are now, I guess, like putting the the price drop, uh, you know, attributing the price drop to this news. The funny thing to me is that last week, before this news came out, people were attributing it to Elon Musk's tweets, right? And I and I spoke about these last week. I said that there's so many variables in markets that pinpoint, you know, pinning any kind of movement on just one event is rarely the right approach. I think that in in I guess like. Maybe in recent memory, uh, I think the COVID dump is the only news event or only kind of like thing that happened that triggered that that you could directly tie to a market movement because it was a global risk off event. It wasn't just crypto; it was every asset class basically getting sold off, going into cash, and then we have like a really, really, really strong recovery after that. Particularly in stocks, crypto took a bit longer, but stocks had a really strong recovery. Like pretty quickly after that. And then obviously crypto, you know, over the course of a year had a very, very strong recovery from those lows. So that event, I would say, is one of the only ones that I can think of. And that's because it was such a large event. If we look at things in like the crypto markets and look at like the kind of local things that have got to do with crypto, I explained this last week, Bitcoin had looked weak, uh, had looked very weak on the markets for about three think two to three months, the inflow seemed to have stopped. All the money was flowing into, you know, out of Bitcoin and into just total crap, right? There were so many scams pumping. There was so much other crap pumping. So, you know, this kind of news that came out um, and all the the stuff that came out, there wasn't just these China bans, you know, Bitcoin stuff. There wasn't just the Elon Musk stuff. There was plenty of stuff that came out. Those... I don't think those were the cause of the of the drops. They may have uh, attributed to the acceleration of it, but I think that we were going down anyway, just based on the fact that the market in general just looked weak, one, uh, especially for Bitcoin. Like ETH was looking strong, but but I think Bitcoin in particular, you know, so much of the market is tied to Bitcoin that, that if Bitcoin dumps as hard as it did, like everything's just going to follow it. Um, I don't think it's going to change anytime soon either, unfortunately, as much as I would love it to. It, it's it's definitely not going to be something that decouples, you know, uh, uh, quicker, you know, as quickly as we would like here. Um, but in saying that, the kind of thought experiment I like to go through is if we were in a bear market, say it was 2019, the ETH price was like, you know, or, or say like the Bitcoin price. I can't remember what the Bitcoin price was. I don't really pay much attention to that. But the ETH price was like. $150 in 2019, which it stayed at for like a lot of 2019. And this news came out. Do you think ETH would have nuked 60% on this news like it did now? No, I don't believe so at all. I think maybe it could have led to maybe a small sell-off or some you know very, very short-term reactionary stuff. But you have to put in context what stage of the market that we're in. We were in a very frothy market. ETH went up like, you know, pretty quickly, right? I mean, you can see on the chart here, basically from, I guess, like the beginning of April, what, what we were at. At the beginning of April, we were at about, I guess, like what, 1900. And we went more than double to like 4K 
in, in about six weeks, right? So that's like a pretty pretty big price rise for ETH considering how big ETH is an asset now. But in that time, we had like all the, the speculation around the dog coins. We had all the speculation around the, the, the scams, all the, the rug pulls, the, the tons of money just flowing in and in and in and like just going into scams and like really shitty old dead projects, dinosaur coins as I've called them. And the market was extremely frothy. So from that context, right, the 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 kind of like a market was already, in my opinion, going to go down regardless. It wanted to go down because it was so frothy and so many people had made so much money that they wanted to cash out and there wasn't enough liquidity to cover everyone cashing out at the same time. So we dropped really quickly. Which brings me to my second thing that I wanted to talk about, which I wrote about in the Daily Grain newsletter today. You should definitely go check that out. It's got a, uh, it's got much more detail, but I'll, I'll give an explanation here. So this meme from Mooney, and for those listening on the podcast, I'll just explain what the meme is. It's a picture of an elephant standing with one leg on a beach ball, like a little you know beach, I guess like uh, a ball that you see like... Uh, you probably know what I'm talking about. It's it's kind of hard to describe, but you know, a beach ball that's really tiny, and on the on the elephant, it's it's labeled everyone's paper gains, and then the beach ball is cu- is labeled liquidity available to cover it. Now, this may not be self-explanatory if you if you're not deep into the markets, you're not a trader or anything. Like I'm not a trader, but this stuff kind of just um, you know interests me, so I, I kind of tend to learn about it. But essentially, what this means is that when you look at your portfolio and you say, okay, I can sell X amount of coins for you know this price, right? You could sell a thousand ETH for, uh, maybe not ETH, but ETH, ETH not, maybe the, the best example, but let's just use that as an example for now. You could sell like a thousand ETH for X amount of dollars at that Y price. That's assuming that the amount of liquidity or the amount of buy pressure exists at that price to, to fill your order, right? So, and, 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 and this is actually really, and this is why a lot of the, the smaller market cap coins can fall so fast because they have much less liquidity than something like ETH. But essentially what happens is that it reaches a tipping point where everyone says, okay, well, I've made so much money and I, I want to start kind of like de-risking here. I want to start cashing out some. But the thing is, if enough people kind of say that at the same time, there's barely any liquidity available to cover all of that sell pressure which means that the prices start to drop really rapidly. Now, when you have a very uh, heavy derivative-driven market, which is what crypto is, where lots of people take on leverage, it's very easy to access leverage, what ends up happening is that when the prices drop um, you know, uh, drop rapidly, people get liquidated. Now, when people get liquidated, the, the assets have to be sold off, which just pushes the prices down further, which leads to more liquidations, which is what some people will call cascading liquidations. And that's when you start to see those really, really violent price swings um, you know, to, to the down side and a lot of fear, you know, kind of um, groups people, they panic sell and then it just, you know, it, it, it kind of becomes a snowball effect. And that's why you see in the chart here, just how brutal it can be. This is the four hour chart. If I, if I switch to the weekly here, you can see just how brutal last week's kind of weekly candle was here. Like in the context of everything else, you know, the weekly here went down, you know, just, just this one week. So starting uh, the 17th of May to the, I think 24th, ETH went down 51%. So over half of ETH's value was just erased in one week. And the only other time in recent memory that that happened was in one week was the COVID dump, right? In, in March of 2020. So you can see relatively just how bad that is. This, this didn't even happen, like, I think after the last bull market. Like, you, you have to kind of, I guess, like, uh, I guess like I'm measuring down to the wick, but like even down to the wick, 45%. So if the blow off top from the 2017 bull market, this didn't even happen. So you can see just the, the panic that ensued here from people just like selling it down and, and it accelerates because more people get liquidated, more people panic sell, more, uh, you know, less liquidity there is to fill all, all of these sales. And then you have this kind of like rapid drop in price. And then eventually it reaches a, a bottom where, people kind of, you know, have dry powder and they're like, wow, the price is like super, super cheap right now. I'm going to just like buy it up here. And then if enough people do that, obviously the trend reverses, you know, sellers run out of ammo too, because you, you eventually reach an equilibrium where there's, le- you know, the sellers have run out of tokens, like not literally run out of tokens, but there's like way less sell pressure because everyone's already sold. And now people, you know, there's, there's always a buyer, right? Doesn't mean, it doesn't matter if the price is dropping. If you can sell into a market, you've sold to someone else. They've bought your coin. That means that you have dry powder now, whether that's in a stable coin or in or in ETH or BTC or whatever, and you want to put that back into other assets. You know, ETH wasn't hasn't hasn't bounced nearly as strong as some of the other ones that fell stronger. Like some of these assets fell like eighty percent or seventy percent, and they've bounced really hard because they've got less liquidity at the end of the day. So they'll they can go up, you know, very fast and go down very fast. And that's exactly what this meme kind of like encapsulates is that. 
just because, you know, the market cap of ETH is, say, a half a trillion dollars, doesn't mean there's half a trillion dollars of uh, of buy pressure waiting for, um, you know, to buy ETH at $4,400, for example. That's never the case. It's never going to be the case. It's not how markets work at all. And the, the easiest way to look at this is actually if you go to CoinGecko's asset pages and go to the markets tab, they'll have a plus or minus 2%, and then they'll have like a, a number underneath that. So, for example, the plus or minus 2%, I was looking at this before for uni on Bitfinex, and I use this example in my newsletter, is 15, 15, uh, sorry, $1.5 million. Uh, so if you were to sell $1.5 million, just market sell it on Bitfinex worth of uni, you would impact the price by 2%. So you wouldn't get you know, the current price of uni times your amount of tokens, you'd get the current price of uni times your amount of tokens minus 2% because you would be taking a 2% um, slippage impact or price impact to sell all in one go. Now, obviously, you know you can tell you can tell what happens when you start selling more than 1.5 million. If if you sell like five million, then you're going to have more than two percent price impact. And it's not just you selling; it's like everyone selling if if they if they're selling. So, and then obviously it cascades down, especially with leverage and liquidated positions. And you can see what I'm talking about here. This this is exactly what played out in the markets over the last few days. This is exactly why crypto is so volatile. And it just and we we all thought it would be less volatile the more mature the asset class gets. But I actually don't consider the asset class to be getting more mature if we're just introducing more leverage into the system. If the market price of the asset is driven by the derivatives market, that is, if there's more um, you know, leverage kind of going on, there's more futures trading, there's more options trading going on than there is of the underlying spot market, um, you know, the normal kind of markets that you and I, um, you know, a lot of you and I will, um, will kind of play in. If the, the derivatives market is driving it, then it's going to drive it in both directions. And it's actually going to be more violent on the way down because of the fact that that liquidity can dry up really quickly and peop and greed is more powerful than fear on the way up and fear is more powerful, uh, way more powerful on the way down. So I hope that it kind of explains to you, like, I guess, like what why we see these violent swings in crypto. And I've talked about this in the past, but I think particularly over the last few days, this just shows like... We have so much leverage in the system right now, and I don't think it's going away because they, these exchanges that offer this leverage are unregulated. They're the Binance's of the world, the FTX's of the world, right? Yes, they bar US customers, but that doesn't mean shit. There's tons of people outside the US that still use these exchanges, uh, and, there's, and there's, you know, there's ways around that, of course, if you're a US citizen, things like that. Um, I'm not sure if Binance still offers this, but they they do offer like no KYC for people uh, for with uh, with a two BTC withdrawal limit. So you can still withdraw like 80k, um, or if BTC is at 40, I don't know what current price of BTC is, but say it's 40k for for now. Um, you could withdraw 80k a day with no KYC, and that's like uh, you know for for a normal retail trader, that's a lot of money, and you can just leverage with that as well. So taking all that into account, then multiplying it by potentially hundreds of thousands of people who are doing this leverage trading, you have a shit ton of leverage uh, or, or a derivatives uh, kind of trading going on in the markets, which means you have a derivative led market, which is always going to lead to volatility here. Don't know if this is going to change. I don't think so. These unregulated exchanges seem to be very resilient to any sorts of um, regulation. Not that I, I invite regulation into this ecosystem. I'm not saying that I want this. And this is exactly what you what's going to happen in a completely free financial system. Um, but I think in general, I just personally had hoped that we had gotten more mature here. But I think as time goes on, these swings are just going to become more and more violent if derivatives keep driving this market. But hopefully I'm proven wrong. Uh, but anyway, I think I'm going to leave it at that for now. It seems that we've bounced up a little bit here. It's always scary with these bounces because you never know if they're actually going to sustain themselves or if it's like a, what's called a dead cat where it'll bounce and then immediately fall back down because everyone's just waiting to sell. Uh, you know, people say, oh, there's going to be a relief bounce selling to that. Well, if everyone sells into the relief bounce and there's not, there ain't going to be no bounce. They're just going to be selling pressure into the, the, what little buy pressure there is. So We'll see what happens. Obviously, long-term bullish, that hasn't changed. Like nothing has changed with regards to Ethereum and ETH's fundamental values here. But in terms of short-term, I know that if you're someone like me who spends a lot of time in this ecosystem, uh, and if you're maybe newer than, than me, this sort of stuff can scare you. And honestly, like I don't know anyone who expected the price to drop uh, nearly this this fast. Uh, I think everyone was blindsided by this. I think, um, you know, I, I, I've said this before on the refuel, but my running theory is that because of this kind of like derivative derivative kind of led uh, price action, we're just going to have faster bull and bear cycles now. Where we go up faster, we drop faster. 
and we just clear this out. We don't have, like, like for example, I don't expect there to be another two-year bear market because we're just going to do the two years worth of uh, bear market price action maybe in like, you know, a, a few days, I'm, like it, it seems like, or a few weeks at this stage. But we'll see if that's invalidated or not. Um, I'm still bullish. I don't think we're going into a, a long-term bear market here. It may take some time, maybe even some months to repair the damage that's done here for ETH to get back to its all-time high. I don't know. We'll see how it goes. This is uncharted territory. The market structure here and the market kind of volatility is definitely uh, very different to what it was, you know, previously. I think a lot of people, uh, you know, there's a lot of newer people in the system as well. So yeah, we'll see how that goes. Uh, I'll leave it at that for the market uh, kind of stuff today. Definitely read the, uh, today's uh, newsletter if you want more details on, on what I was talking about here with regards to Mooney's tweet. So Rick Dudley had an interesting uh, kind of tweet uh, with regards to the side chains versus L2 debate, uh, which I which I actually really uh, kind of like agree with here. So basically, what he said was he we said we should stop talking about side chains. There are L2s and L1s with trusted bridges to other L1s. If we have L1 L2 language, there is no reason to even talk about side chains anymore. I think this is a really great way of framing it. I'm actually really um, uh, really uh, excited about this framing because of the fact that. There are so, so many, um, I guess, like narratives out there of what constitutes or definitions of what constitutes a side chain, what constitutes a, a layer one, what's an out layer two, blah, 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 what's a bridge, all this sort of stuff. So just boiling it down to we have, you know, layer ones like Ethereum, we have layer ones like Bitcoin, they can bridge to each other. And the bridge is essentially the thing that we should be focusing on with regards to the security of assets. So let's use a, a very obvious example here of Polygon, for example, right? Polygon is typically referred to as a side chain because it does not inherit its security from Ethereum. But if we're using this new terminology, or I mean, this existing terminology, if we don't use the word side chain, how else can we subscribe, uh, uh, describe Polygon or the Polygon POS chain? We can describe it as another layer one, right? With a bridge to Ethereum. So it's it's essentially like any other layer one, except in my view, Polygon is, is friendly to Ethereum. So that's why they've been embraced by the Ethereum community. But the central point of failure is still that bridge. For those of you who don't know, the bridge from Ethereum to Polygon is secured by um, the, the, the Polygon POS validator set, but it has a multi-sig on it. So a five of eight multi-sig where five of the signers could get together and theoretically they could steal all the funds inside the bridge, right? Which is there's billions of dollars in there because every time you want to bridge your assets over from Ethereum to Polygon or the Polygon POS chain, you need to go through that bridge and locks your assets on there and mints you those assets on the POS chain. So technically... Um, th those assets could be stolen from you if the bridge operators wanted to do this. Now, of course, you know, uh, I don't think they're going to do this, or whatever, but you're still trusting this, this kind of like, you know, multi-sig signers at the end of the day. And, you know, Polygon has put out a tweet around why this is the case before. I'm not going to go into it now. I've spoken about it before, but that's what we should be focusing on. And I totally agree with Rick here. If there's a, if, if, if your chain is typically referred to as a side chain to Ethereum, well, then it's just an existing, you know, it's just a, another layer one with a bridge. So in, in, in all honesty, you can say, okay, well, you know, the, the chain itself is secured by its validator set, and that's true, but whatever assets are not native to the chain, whatever assets that were bridged over are secured by the bridge. They're not secured by the, the, the validator set of the new chain, and they're not even secured by Ethereum anymore, right? If you put assets in that smart contract, uh, those assets are not secured. I mean, technically, they are secured by the Ethereum network, right? But the thing is, uh, you always have to look at like the, 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 the central point of failure, which is that multi-sig anyway. Um, uh, so anyway, I think kind of like I'm going to be using this terminology from now on. I think that the term sidechain doesn't really mean anything to anyone. Layer two as a term is also uh, lost of a lot, lot of its meanings, but I still use layer two to refer to a, I guess, like solution that sits on top of Ethereum that actually inherits Ethereum security. So something like a rollup where the security of the rollup comes directly from Ethereum's miners or Ethereum stakers, right? Depending on what stage we're at in terms of Ethereum li Ethereum's life cycle here. So yeah, really great tweet from Ricky. I think it really kind of like boils down the debate to very simple terms. And this is what I'm going to be using. Well, this is the terminology I'm going to be using going forward. 
So speaking of uh, scalability solutions here or layer twos and whatnot, uh, Chris from MakerDAO had a really great thread here where he basically broke down the differences between Optimism and Arbitrum, the two leading optimistic roll-up solutions. Now, I've spoken about these two a lot in the past. You know a lot about them already, so I'm not going to go into both of them. But essentially, this thread will break down the positives, uh, negatives, drawbacks, whatever, for both of these solutions, what they're good at, what they're not good at. And I think, I don't know if he, I think, yeah, he says he's cheering for both projects here. He's not really picking a winner. It's way too early to pick a winner here. And again, I don't think there's going to be a winner takes all kind of thing. I believe that these solutions will basically exist, you know, side by side uh, and grow side by side. But if you're interested in the differences between them, um, you know, definitely go check out this thread from Chris. It'll be linked in the YouTube description below. So Aztec, uh, one of my favorite projects in the space that isn't talked about enough actually, put out a blog post uh, basically uh, titled Bringing Privacy to DeFi, which it, which describes essentially why they're building kind of like Aztec for DeFi and what Aztec's private rollup will be able to do for DeFi. The three main things here is that it'll be able to do, well, the two main things is that it'll be able to bring privacy to Ethereum, which is obviously solely needed, especially within DeFi and scalability, of course, because it's a roll up, but there's also uh, trade-offs um, that, that are included here as well. And then they give kind of like a glimpse ahead. So I suggest reading this blog post. It's a short read. It's only a three minute read here. They're saying they're going to bring out more details in the coming weeks about what they're actually building here and, and what apps can be used and how everyone can use it. So I'm looking forward to that as well. But definitely go give this blog post a read. So speaking of blog post, Vitalik put out a really great one today called The Limits to Blockchain Scalability, where he basically breaks down, um, you know, how blockchain scale at layer one, not layer two, but how they can scale at layer one, the the limits to that scalability, as he implies in the title here, the drawbacks, the, the, the positives, what we can do, what we can't do, you know, how far we can push layer one scalability while still um, retaining, I guess, kind of like a decentralized blockchain. Now, uh, you know, a lot of this alludes to kind of like small block culture. If, if any of you know about like the Bitcoin kind of like fork wars between Bitcoin and Bitcoin Cash and what that was about, that was essentially boiled down to small blocks versus big blocks. So obviously Bitcoin has small blocks. It can only process, a, uh, you know, a small number of transactions a second. Um, and, you know, it has a 10 minute block time or, time or a target of 10 minutes per block. Ethereum also has a relatively small block size. It can only trend, uh, only kind of like do a, a, on average 15 transactions per second. It's a bit different because of the gas limit. Um, but yeah, on average, it's, oh, it's about 15 transactions per second here. Now, the way to scale that up and the way that Ethereum is kind of, um, I guess, like uh, going, the path that Ethereum is going down is sharding. And there's two main kind of like families of sharding here called data availability sharding, which is which can be used to boost layer two scalability and then execution uh, sharding, which may or may not be coming sometime in the future, which basically allows layer one scalability to go, you know, I guess like 64x if there's 64 shards, for example. So essentially what this blog post boils down to is that Vitalik believes in the, uh, I guess like it doesn't believe in a small blocker, doesn't believe in big blocker. He's a medium sized blocker. So somewhere in between, which has actually been my view for quite a while as well, where I figured that Small blocks are too restrictive. Large blocks are way too, uh, you know, uh, you know, way, way too um, uh, ambitious and leads to a lot of, uh, you know, negative externalities that we don't want and, and leads to centralization. So can we find somewhere in the middle with medium blocks? And I think we can. I think that we can do that with sharding. I think we can do that with statelessness. And I think we can do that with improving how the clients handle uh, the Ethereum blockchain itself um, and things like that. And obviously, you know, uh, we're moving to staking, but that's not going to play a big part in, in the scalability, um, you know, kind of, uh, I guess, arena there. But anyway, definitely recommend reading this this blog post. Vitalik always does a great job of explaining these things in very simple terms. And he doesn't, uh, you know, doesn't go into too much te technical stuff here, which I thought was really cool as well. So yeah, if you want to understand kind of like why Ethereum hasn't just like scaled like these other blockchains um, claim that they'll be able to do, it real, really boils down to, to that, you know, keeping the decentralization within Ethereum and not wanting to centralize. So yeah, recommend giving this blog post a read. So another thing that happened with China actually over the last few days was that they began to start cracking down on DeFi apps. So a lot of you will know that China's internet is controlled by the Great Firewall of um, of China, where they block a lot of different websites. They started blocking DeFi websites. So many of the popular ones were just outright blocked. You couldn't access them. So in, uh, I guess, like in return, uh, the Yearn Finance team deployed uh, a mirror to Yearn.Finance, which uh, runs on IPFS. So it is not running on, you know, the normal kind of like 
I guess centralized web service here. It is running on, on, on IPFS, which is really cool. And I think this actually speaks to the fact that we need more decentralized front ends within uh, DeFi. We need them all to be on IPFS. We need them all to be everywhere on, on Rweave, on Filecoin, whenever, wherever you can put them, we need them to be because if not, it's just very easy for governments to block DeFi front ends, which, which blocks out a lot of users. Yes, you can directly access the smart contracts yourself if you want to, but it's very technical. It can lead to user error very easily and it can lead to users losing their funds very easily. So you definitely want to be able to have um, a variety of front ends, both decentralized and centralized uh, that make DeFi extremely resilient if, if they've been deployed. So kudos to the Yearn team for, for being so quick on this. I, I, I hope other teams follow suit here. So Ben has his latest What's New in ETH2 update uh, that he published over the weekend. There is a lot in this update. It's very meaty. There, it's covering Altair, the first ETH2 upgrade. Rayanism, the, uh, the uh, I guess, like ETH1 to ETH2 merge testnet uh, uh, effort that's currently underway. Uh, details on the merge or updates on the merge. Staking, usual explainers, and research. Uh, if you haven't checked out this latest update, I highly recommend doing so. And I also highly recommend subscribing uh, at ETH2.news. Uh, you can subscribe to the RSS feed because this is and uh, this has been and remains to be the best resource for keeping up with ETH2. It's where all I get all of my ETH2 information. So I highly recommend going and subscribing here. So just a quick note here, a project that I'm heavily involved in as, a, as an advisor and investor here called Mstable, which a lot of you are probably aware of, is currently hiring for a bunch of different roles. Now, they're hiring for marketing, business development, they're hiring Solidity developers, and a lord of the Discord or you know, in other words, a community manager. If you think you can fit any of these roles, I highly recommend getting in touch with a James here. So you can reach out to him on Twitter. Uh, I'll link this in the YouTube description. You can go check it out. Um, I can attest to this team being awesome to work with. They're building really cool products. I love working with them. They're all really laid back people uh, and they get stuff done. They ship as well. So if you're looking to break into crypto, I couldn't think of a better team to kind of um, go with here. And there's a variety of roles here as well, right? Marketing, BD, Solidity Development um, and Community Management. I, I feel like a lot of uh, people watching this and listening to this fall into those categories. So if this is something you're interested in, definitely give James a shout here. Uh, his DMs are open. So Bloomberg is finally publishing uh, good crypto media coverage here. So in this piece, they are titled Ethereum closes in on long sought fix to cut energy use over 99%. Uh, is where it is a piece in which they describe Ethereum's move to proof of stake, aka the merge. Now, this has been a very hot topic lately, obviously because of the, uh, I guess, like uh, discussions around uh, the energy use of proof of work and all that sort of stuff. And obviously, Ethereum is is hitting back, or the Ethereum community is hitting back, saying, "Well, yes, Ethereum is bad right now; it uses this energy, but later on in the year, hopefully, or maybe early next year, we will have this merge done where we get rid of proof of work and we move to a proof of stake system, like a full proof of stake system, and we do." In fact, cut energy use by over 99% here. Now, I've seen a lot of people say that they think this is too good to be true. It's not. We really will cut it by, down by this much. And I've explained why in the past. It's because staking is just fundamentally different. You are essentially swapping the miners for stakers, like for, 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 for staking coins, for example, right? as your security of the network. And you have software that you run on your on your PC, but you don't require this software to be running at 100% capacity um, you know, in some warehouse, chewing up all this electricity to verify or validate the network. So it is true. Now, uh, you can read this piece if you're not paywall, if you if you have a subscription. I think it's behind a paywall. I can't read it, uh, unfortunately. But yeah, you can definitely check it out. I'll link it in the YouTube description. I, I highly recommend going and, and checking it out because it's just always good to support, I guess, mainstream coverage of crypto. That's actually good coverage. So Santiago shared this snippet from Goldman Sachs Global Macro Research Report here. And basically the snippet that he shared is a full screenshot. I won't read the whole thing out, but the interesting segment is, is this. And I quote, Ether beats Bitcoin as a store of value. The Ethereum ecosystem provides developers a way to create new apps. Most of DeFi apps are built on Ethereum. The great number of transactions in Ether versus Bitcoins reflects this dominance. Um, and then he goes on to say, a major argument in favor of Bitcoin as a st store of value is its limited supply, but demand, not scarcity, drives the success of stores of value. Now, this is something that I've argued for a very long time. 
just because you have a scarce asset doesn't mean that people are going to, you know, be in, it doesn't mean there's going to be demand for it, right? And we've seen this play out with the NFT space, actually, where there's a lot of NFTs that you could say are scarce because they're one of ones or one of tens or whatever. But if no one wants them, then that scarcity doesn't mean anything at the end of the day. Like I can, I've got plenty of scarce things around my house that are really sentimental, you know, really have sentiment of value to me, but I couldn't sell it for anything. I could probably like, uh, you know, sell it for something at, at, you know, a trash and treasure place, something very little, probably like, you know, a, a few dollars or something like that. But there's no way that would ever be considered a store of value or people would ever pay me a lot of money for that. Um, whereas... I think that the Ethereum economy and the way um, the the Ethereum kind of network drives demand for Ether as an asset, which I've gone over you know plenty of times on the refuel before, is what's going to make ETH a better store of value than Bitcoin in the long run. I actually think it's already better, but of course the market doesn't agree with that until ETH is worth more than Bitcoin, which it will be. But we have to wait until that happens for for more people to clue into this. But all the value drivers of ETH are just much better than Bitcoin. I think that. I mean, I saw a tweet the other day that Bitcoin gets its value from being like being a faith-based asset, and then it was there was pushback on that, saying, "Well, no, it's not faith-based. You know, you know, the, the security of Bitcoin is real. People are using Bitcoin. Uh, Bitcoin is used as kind of like a hedge against monetary inflation, all this sort of stuff, and that's fine. I get that, but so is ETH." I truly do believe ETH fits that exact same role and so much more. So I won't go on about this anymore here because I've, I've spoken about this plenty of times on the refuel, but it's good to see kind of, I guess, like TradFi, like Goldman Sachs recognizing this. Not that I think that we should be kind of like vying for their approval on these sorts of things, but they have lots of reach. A lot of people listen to them. A lot of old money listens to them. So for them to be saying this is very positive for the ecosystem overall. And I think it's just another signal to use in the adoption cycle of the crypto asset class as a whole. And another kind of very positive piece of, uh, I guess, literature that was published uh, that Santiago also shared here was a piece or a research paper called DeFi Beyond the Hype, The Emerging World of Decentralized Finance, which was published by uh, Wharton, which is a very prestigious university in Pennsylvania here in the US. This report is is pretty detailed. It's about a 20-page report, and it goes through essentially, you know, what DeFi is, how it works, what the, the value prop is, all that good stuff here. But again, this is just another kind of thing that's been published by the old world that is kind of, uh, I guess, signaling that Ethereum and DeFi are the future, right? And we all know it's the future, but it's good to get validation on this sort of stuff from outside of the crypto ecosystem. But yeah, I'll link this in the YouTube description. You can go check this out for yourself. Because uh, the final thing I wanted to get to is actually a question in the comments here that I promised that I would... Um, I would answer on today's refuel. This question comes from Naz, and he says, I keep hearing people say that once Ethereum goes to proof of stake, those who have staked will have more validating power, and therefore, this will make take a little bit away from Ethereum's decentralization. Is this, is this how staking, validating, and proof of stake works? Thank you again for your content help. Now, I do want to remind people that I am doing an AMA series every two weeks now in the Discord channel. I am actually taking questions prior to the AMA um, you know, happening. So the next AMA is going to happen this Saturday. The time will be the same times as I did it last time, 11 p.m. Australian Eastern Standard Time, whatever that translates to you is um, is what it is there. And I record them and put them on YouTube and everything like that. So if you want to ask me questions and I can answer them all on that AMA, Go, there's an AMA uh, channel in the Discord. Go ask them there, and, and I'll answer all of those um, this coming Saturday. But but for just for today, I'll, I'll, I'll answer this question. So essentially... What this boils down to is is asking kind of like, how do we measure, measure decentralization of a blockchain? Now, this is a pretty big question. I've spoken about this in the past, but it's not just based on the validators. Proof of stake, uh, and as I just described before, moves validation to uh, you know away from kind of like miners, so where 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 miners validate um, and produce blocks for the network to stakers. So instead of mining machines, it's coins, right? So the same argument that those who have the most staked, uh, you know, have, have, I guess, like more power over the network uh, can be applied to those who have the most miners have more power over the network, for example. And that, and that the same thing goes for like mining pools and staking pools. Now, the reason why these things are decentralized, it goes far beyond just the amount of power any kind of central party has here. There's also game theory at play. Now, if you think about it, if someone was able to amass 51% of the mining power and start doing 51% attacks on Bitcoin or Ethereum, what do you think would happen to the price of BTC or ETH? Most likely it would go down. Now you could say, oh, well, someone could do this attack and then short it. Okay, that's fine. They could. 
and and you know they might make money doing that but that's a very risky strategy and w doing this in staking is actually much worse than doing this in mining in mi with mining and I actually think this is a is a fatal flaw of proof of work in the long run you can basically keep 51% attacking as long as you're happy to pay the electricity cost to do so um, whereas with staking, if you do it and then the, the, the kind of like, I guess, like the community catches you doing it or the chain catches you doing it, you'll get slashed. So you can only do it once. You can only do this attack once and then your entire kind of like stake will be slashed, aka it will be burned, deleted from existence. It will be gone. You will no longer have it and you will no longer be able to attack the network because your validators will be ejected from the, um, the active validator set. So from that perspective, I actually believe proof of stake is more decentralized than proof of work, regardless of, of what the of the centralization of validating power here. And there's a post by Vitalik called "Why Proof of Stake" that I suggest you go and all, you go all read. Um, you can just Google it; it'll be it'll be the first result there. That describes this in a much better way than I can. But I hope that answers the core of the question here. But on the second part, is how we measure decentralization. We don't just measure it by the validating power. We measure it by a lot of different things. I think the strongest thing is the social layer of these systems. Do we have uh, a social layer for Ethereum where if something were to happen, a bug, an attack or whatever, can we recover from that by using the humans? Layer zero, as I like to call it. And I think Ethereum can. I think even Bitcoin can because we have they have very strong social layers. And what also plays into this is running full nodes. Like how many full nodes exist? Well, for Ethereum, there's like over 5,000 full nodes last time I checked. I think there's over 10,000, but different sites track it in different ways. Same goes for Bitcoin. So can can those node runners and can the community come together to say, well, you know, this attacker chain is actually not the real chain. The real chain is what my full node says it is and what everyone else's full node says it is and things like that. So from that point of view, there's that aspect of it. There's also um, decentralization of, I guess, like the market, like what, you know, would the, the exchanges, the centralized exchanges aren't going to recognize the attacker's chain as the real chain, as the main chain. They're not going to honor the, the, the deposits and withdrawals for that, that for that. They honor whatever the community decides. So so at the end of the day, the decentralization really comes down to the community and the social layer and how you encourage a good social layer is by allowing um, people to, to to participate in the consensus of the system and also to participate as a as a full node runner. This is why um, Bitcoiners and and Ethereum's Ethereum's will always go on about, well, we can't just scale the blockchain up too fast on layer one because that would make it harder for people to run nodes, which breaks down the social consensus layer, which makes um, the chains way more prone to attack. It's not just the centralization concerns, it's the attack concerns as well, it's the security concerns. So from that point of view, we should always be encouraging as many people to run a full node as possible, which I hope that you're doing, by the way, it's not hard to do. Um, but we, but to do that, we need to keep Ethereum uh, light. We need to keep the blockchain as easy to sync as possible. We need to encourage... Um, people to do this, we need to make it very easy for them to do that, to, to run nodes. And we need to keep the social layer of all these systems very strong so that we can recover from, from any sorts of attacks here. So I hope that answers your question, Naz. I definitely uh, get this question a lot from people. And I think really, there's a really great blog post from Balaji called Quantifying Decentralization. He wrote this back in 2018, I believe, or maybe 2017. And it goes over all these points. And I think he, he puts it the best way. I think he's, he definitely defines it in the best way possible. Um, and, and hits it on the head, but also the proof of stake blog post from Vitalik. So again, um, uh, uh, quantifying decentralization from Balaji and why proof of stake from Vitalik are two of the required kind of readings on this on this subject. But I'll leave it at that for today because um, time is up. But thank you everyone again for reading, not reading, sorry, listening and watching uh, today's refill episode. Be sure to subscribe to the channel if you haven't yet. Give the video a thumbs up, subscribe to the newsletter, join the Discord channel, and I'll catch you all tomorrow. Thanks everyone.